All right, hello everyone. Good to see you all. Uh, thanks for being here for our first post summer series Wednesday night. Um, grateful you all are here. Um, as we get into more, uh, more typical Wednesday evening, uh, Wednesday evening order of service, instead of singing, we'll begin with a word of prayer and we'll take prayer requests and then we'll move into class for tonight. So what prayer requests or prayers of praise do we have that we would like to lift up to God uh, this evening? Sue. Better than I'm here. Yes. So glad to see you and glad that you are starting to feel a little bit better after the fall and the clot. Absolutely. Bob. Yes, I'm speaking with Leslie today. And she said she's going to Monday surgery. And she's very, very nervous. So okay. if she says, please pray for her now. Please pray for her. All right, we will. Leslie is having surgery on Monday, so be praying for her and that the Lord will bless that to go well. Uh, I believe Craig and Barbara Hickey are still uh, traveling for their 14th anniversary, so we want to pray for a great trip and safe travels back for them. Anything else? Daisy. Is that right, Chris? Yes, Saturday. All right. Be praying for that. So Ron, uh, he was he and I were talking yesterday. Uh, I accidentally got the date wrong, so I, I told everyone the wrong information. I thought it was today he was supposed to get stents. It's next Wednesday, so I apologize for that. Uh, it, the plan is next Wednesday for him to get two more stents in his heart, but uh, he's feeling pretty weak. Uh, breathing is pretty difficult, and right now also he's having some, some stomach issues as well, so uh, yeah, he'd really appreciate the prayers. All right, if there's nothing else, uh, bow with me and let's go to God in prayer. Thank you, Father, for this evening. Thank you for this time in the middle of the week that this church family sets aside to see one another and to come before you in prayer together and also to take a deeper dive into your word. And we pray that this is a time that glorifies you and we pray that this is a time that's a blessing to us. Father, before we get into our study for tonight, we want to lift up uh, those we've mentioned this evening. We want to give you a prayer of praise and thanksgiving that Sue is with us tonight, that she's um, feeling better. Uh, from the fall and from also the clot in, in her neck, and we pray that we'll continue to watch over and bless her and Daryl each day. We continue to, to uh, lift up as well our sister Leslie. We pray your blessings on her between now and Monday when she has uh, surgery. We pray that you will bless that surgery to go well and the recovery. And Lord, we also pray for her peace of mind, uh, that you will comfort and strengthen her, walk with her through this time. We also want to pray for Craig and Barbara, that you'll bless them as they are celebrating their, their 14th anniversary. Bless them as they travel. We pray you'll keep them safe as they return back and that it's a great trip for the two of them. We also want to continue to pray for Daisy's uh, co-worker, Linda, who has uh, just a variety of, of challenges and trials she's facing in her life right now. You know what they are and you know what she needs. We pray your blessings uh, on her. We want to pray for our brother and our elder, Chris, uh, who'll be heading out Saturday on a work trip. We pray that you'll keep them safe and that, uh, that that will go well, and we pray that uh, he'll be back with us uh, in due time. And Father, we also want to pray for our brother Ron, uh, that you'll bless him each day, uh, that he'll know uh, the love of this church family even from a distance, and that you'll bless him with his heart, and with the possibility of stents coming, being put in next week. Uh, bless him with the stomach issues he's feeling as well. Please bless Ramona. Father, you, you know uh, what they're facing, what they're going through. We're so grateful for his faith in you. Uh, for his love for you and for your people, and we pray that you will watch over both of them. Father, we want to ask your blessings on this new uh, study that we get into tonight, and we pray that throughout this fall that uh, you'll bless this time uh, to be a time in which we're all drawn into your word, 
and in the process, come to know you better and, and to live uh, more fully in relationship with you because of what you've done for us uh, in, in your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, <clears throat> I am excited to begin a new class tonight. Before we get into it, uh, I want to make a little disclaimer. Uh, I am trying to kind of change the way I go about, not drastically change, but change some of the way I go about preparing for class. I'm trying to do it in a little bit more of an efficient way, but that means that my notes aren't quite the same as they usually are, and I don't know how it's going to go. So if it's a little bit rough, tonight, and, and if it's a little bit rough at the start of this series, I ask for your patience that you bear with me in that. We'll, we'll just have to see how that goes. Um, <clears throat> but as we get into tonight, I want to set a little bit of context. You may not remember this because it's a whole year ago, but last September, at the end of our previous summer series, which was on the book of James, after that, we started a class that we called Getting to Know the Old Testament. And that class was all about familiarizing ourselves uh, with this huge portion of our Bibles, that is the Old Testament, and we especially focused on this narrative thread, this story of redemption that can be traced all through the Old Testament and how that story then moves on to the New Testament. So that's what we did two, uh, well, that's, that's what we did last year, starting last September. And then, of course, just this summer, we just wrapped up a summer series on King David. Uh, and so that means, of course, we're looking at the Old Testament. All, we were looking at the Old Testament all through the summer uh, and seeing what that portion of the Old Testament tells us about uh, how to live seeking God's heart. David is famously remembered as a man after God's own heart. Uh, and we can see in David, in this great Old Testament figure, we can see kind of a dim, uh, kind of an imperfect reflection of Jesus in, in David. And that's another big reason why we looked at him all summer. And so... As a complement to those classes that have been very Old Testament focused, uh, I would like us to turn now to a book of the New Testament that really draws heavily from the Old Testament. And I think doing that uh, throughout this fall will help us uh, see how appreciating the Old Testament and understanding what God is communicating to us there can help us better understand what God is communicating to us in the New Testament. Uh, and so that's what we're going to be doing this fall. And that book is the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. So I want to begin tonight. It is just, you know, an introductory class. I want to begin with a question. Uh, how many of you have read the book of Hebrews in the fairly recent past? Say, within the past year. Okay, a good number of hands. Okay, about half. Maybe, maybe a third or so went up. All right, so especially for those of you who just raised your hands, but really for all of you, if you have Hebrews at least kind of in your memory, um, what did you think the last time you read Hebrews? What did you think about Hebrews? Did it make a lot of sense? Chastity says it makes good sense. I saw her nodding her head. Okay, Kelsey said she just read it and it didn't make sense. All right. Did I see your hand up, Ernie? Yeah, let me get this to you if you don't mind. Oh, I thought I saw it go up. Well, go ahead. Uh, I've read it before and uh, talked about the Hebrew, uh, talking about the Christians being persecuted. And uh, that's basically what I got out of it. Okay. The persecution. Okay, yeah. Yeah, there are some references to that in Hebrews. Um, would anyone say that Hebrews, uh, Bob, was that your hand? Yes, I was going to say, I was okay. concerned about the writer, the author. Yeah. Um, if you didn't hear Bob, I know the microphone's coming to you. Why don't you just say that again, Bob? There we go. Thanks. I was concerned about the author or the writer of Hebrews. That's what I was concerned about. Yeah. We'll talk about that some tonight. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, Ernie. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll see that. I think we'll touch on that hopefully some tonight and see that as we go along. So Hebrews is often considered one of the more difficult books of the New Testament. Uh, it's not quite on par with kind of the ultimate challenge in the New Testament, which is Revelation. That's the book that most everyone wants to just avoid. Uh, but Hebrews is considered one of the more difficult books 
of the New Testament. And we'll talk some about some of the reason for that tonight. But once we do kind of move through some of the difficulties there in Hebrews and begin to really appreciate uh, the message of this book, I think we can see how it really, really creatively and really beautifully weaves in so much of the message of the Old Testament, so much of the story of the Old Testament to teach us about Christ and to teach us about the new covenant that we live in with Christ and to teach us about um, how our relationship with God is through Christ and how that relationship can really shape our daily lives. Uh, and so I'm really excited to look at those things. Uh, I actually just really love the book of Hebrews. Uh, if you've talked to me one-on-one -on -one about some of my studies at school and stuff and if you've been in Sunday morning Bible class, you probably know that I have a, a special place in my heart for the books of Luke and Acts, but if there was like a second place, it probably would be the book of Hebrews. I, I really love the book of Hebrews, um, but a, apart from that, there's just a lot of wonderful things in this book. So what we'll do tonight is we'll talk a little bit about the value of Hebrews. We'll talk some about how it connects with the Old Testament. We'll do a couple of just kind of basic introductory things. Um, as well, and then, Lord willing, we'll move into really engaging this book uh, next week. So first, thinking some more about the value of Hebrews. Hebrews might seem like a really strange book, and if you've read it recently, uh, I'd be curious to hear if you ag agree with me on this, but at first glance, if you're just reading through Hebrews, it might seem like a really strange book that isn't super relevant for our lives when we first read it. Uh, because there's a lot of stuff in here that, like it goes on and on, talking about the wilderness generation of the Israelites, and how they wandered around in the desert for 40 years. Uh, it will talk about the tabernacle, and it will get really into the specifics of like what was in the tabernacle, what was going on there. Um, it will talk about this obscure guy from Genesis called Melchizedek, someone who, if it wasn't for Hebrews, we'd have little reason to concern ourselves with, but Hebrews makes a big deal out of this, out of this gentleman, Melchizedek. So these are all things that are not exactly just on the forefront of our minds every day. Uh, as we're going about uh, work or as we're taking care of family or doing whatever, we're probably not thinking about Melchizedek or the tabernacle or, or, or whatever. Uh, and so these kinds of things are a good reminder to us that the Bible was written in a very different time, in a very different world, uh, than our own. But if we can move past uh, some of those uh, difficulties and if we can kind of keep ourselves from getting overwhelmed by all the foreign stuff that's, that's talked about in Hebrews, I think we can see in this book a really beautiful and a really powerful call in this book to persevere, a powerful call to not give up in our walks with God. And so for all the strangeness of Hebrews and all the ways it might, have, on the surface, not seem relevant, the message is one that everyone needs to hear. And we know that because life is hard, right? You have to persevere. Um, there are lots of reasons to give up on anything that matters to us in life. Lots of things that could, uh, could move us to abandon them and walk away from them. And Hebrews is a big call to persevere to finish the race, it will talk. It will use some ra some of that language of a race. Finish the race, not give up, and that's of course a message that Christians, in particular, we really need to hear when it comes to our relationship with God, because uh, there are lots of things that can wear Christians down, that can wear us out, and can tempt us to just give up on our faith in God altogether. Either give up in the sense of like, say I'm no longer a Christian, or give up in the sense that's like, okay, I'll continue to be a Christian, but I'm just not going to focus on this stuff anymore, you know. Uh, so there are lots of things that can tempt us to give up. So uh, what are some of those things? What are, what are some of the main things that can really wear Christians down and that can tempt us to give up in one way or another uh, in our faith in God? Let's name some. Yeah. And they really don't deserve it. Yeah. That question of why do the wicked prosper? It's a major question asked a lot in the Bible. Yeah. Tragedy. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Think about, we obviously, when we think about tragedy and figures experiencing in the Bible, we think of Job. Uh, and Job, of course, persevered in his faith, but it, his wife apparently did not, you know. And certainly tragedy moves people to walk away. What else? Sue? Even sickness in your own life can wear you down. Yeah. Not to the point that you want to stay away, but it just wears you down sometimes. It's like, I don't have the strength for, to go on. Yeah. And then we realize that no matter what, God is still with us. Yeah, amen. But you're right. It can also... It can, yeah. It can become a temptation, right, to, to wear down our faith. Mary. I think about how people say of other people what they think about them. I'm sorry. Okay. What they think about them and they lose their faith because they're listening to what other people, you know, how yeah. they value them. And yeah. it's not always, you know, correct, but you don't lose your faith on what people think of you. Yeah. But, yeah, peer pressure from non-believers can be really strong. I think a lot of... Go ahead, Jess. I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm a bad person for saying this, but I think a lot of uh, people lose their faith because of Christians. Yeah. No, that's completely true. I don't think you're a bad person. No, I mean, I think we'd all acknowledge that. Yeah, Christians sometimes are very poor representatives of Christ, and that's just the reality. Dave. Well, to kind of tie the two together, people can get burnt out of doing yeah. things within the congregation and not having that fulfilled time with God. Yeah. And putting too much faith in people instead of in God. Yep. Absolutely. That's so true. So, I mean, there's a lot. And one other thing that, that we didn't mention, but I think we several of us are kind of hitting around it, is kind of the gospel of the world, of our culture. Um, the word gospel means good news, and so the world, it's not good news ultimately, right? leads to separation from God, but in a sense, they have a gospel. Like, the world disciples people, and this is the danger, this is kind of the scary thing. If we're not be, being disciples of Christ, it's not like we're disciples of no one. We're either disciples of Christ, or the world is discipling us, and we may not, not even know it. Uh, but anyways, there are all kinds of things that can, um, that can pressure us, tempt us, move us to give up on our faith, uh, and that means we really need the message of Hebrews. It's a huge call to persevere. It's a huge shot in the arm of encouragement saying, don't give up. This is all worth it. Um, so the book of Hebrews really helps us in that regard. And Hebrews is not only a call to just generically persevere, and it's not a call to say, like, you know, toughen up, buttercup, and just hang in there. I mean, there, there's some of that in there, but it's really un under the surface. It's a call to, to persevere by finding your strength, uh, and finding your encouragement and finding our hope in Jesus, saying, keep your eyes on him, look to him. Uh, he, will, he will carry you through. He will help you through uh, the hard things in life. Uh, and so it's a call to, to rely not on our own strength, but to allow him uh, to strengthen us. And Hebrews, as it does this, it doesn't just tell us to lean on Jesus. It's, it, it's not a book where the author is just saying, Lean on Jesus, lean on Jesus, lean on... He's not just telling you to do it. The Hebrews author, throughout the whole thing, takes a lot of care and attention to show us how and also show us why we can rely on Jesus. Shows us why it is that he can give you all the strength, he can carry us through, he can help us persevere. Uh, so Hebrews discusses at length, it talks a lot about how powerful Jesus is. Uh, it talks a lot about... What is the real significance of what Jesus did while he was on the earth? And why does that matter for us now? Uh, Hebrews talks a lot about uh, the real significance of his sacrifice on the cross. Uh, and, and it also talks about what Jesus is even doing now. And when we think about Jesus, we tend to think about what he did 2,000 years ago. And he rose again and he's going to come back. But Hebrews also talks about even now, at this moment, uh, Jesus is working for you. Uh, he is active now, just like he was active in his earthly ministry. Um, so Hebrews has a lot to say about these things. And Hebrews also, uh, in addition to, to calling us to look to Jesus, it also teaches us 
encourages us to not only look to Jesus, but also look around and be inspired uh, and, and be encouraged by all those who have gone on before us within the family of faith, the community of faith. Look at all those who've gone on before us and persevered in their relationship uh, with God. And, and look not only to Jesus as the ultimate example, but as all these other examples uh, as well. And so Hebrews is a, is a great book for um, when, when we feel all alone. And Satan loves to make us feel this way, right? When we're off on our own, uh, we're, we can be a lot more susceptible to his temptations. But when we feel all alone, when we feel like we can't go on, when we feel like the struggles in life are just too much, uh, and maybe the struggles related, with, uh, related to our faith are just too much, and we start to feel like maybe we'd be better off without all this. Maybe we'd be better off without the Lord. Um, Hebrews will remind us that there's so many others who have faced so much, uh, and, and we can find encouragement in the example that they set for us and how they look to God as they were facing the hard things that they were facing in their world and, and in their lives. And then also when Hebrews talks about, uh, going back to Jesus here, when Hebrews talks about Christ and what he's done and all of these kinds of things, um, it doesn't just talk about it in the abstract. Hebrews is not just like a, a doctrinal survey of what Christ has done. It's not, all, it's not just theoretical. Um, Hebrews also takes a lot of time to praise and really magnify uh, Jesus Christ for what he's done for us. And so not just the facts of what Jesus has done, but the beauty of Jesus and the beauty of his love, his faithfulness, his victory over the grave, his victory over evil, uh, the beauty of these things is on really powerful display uh, in Hebrews. And this is uh, a really really beautiful thing about the book because all people are really drawn to beauty. Uh, this is just part of, of humans. We're, we are drawn to beauty kind of like moths are drawn to light. Like we're just so attracted to it. Uh, whether that's beauty that we see out in nature, you know, is, there's a reason why people love beautiful sunsets or beautiful landscapes. Uh, even we often find beauty in architecture. You know, people, if, if they're traveling around Europe, they love to go in like the cathedrals and things. Uh, and there's other kinds of buildings that can just like move us like, wow, that's, that's a really impressive sight. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, of course, music is something that really moves people. Uh, so we're really drawn to beauty. And the author of Hebrews, in the same way, he doesn't just want us to know the bare facts about uh, how God relates to us through Jesus and what that can mean for us. Uh, he really wants us to see uh, the deep and, and the really overwhelming, really, the overwhelming power and beauty uh, of what God has done in Jesus and allow ourselves to be drawn, again, kind of like moths to light, allow ourselves to be drawn to Jesus and drawn to God uh, through Jesus. So as we think about the value of Hebrews, Hebrews offers a lot that can be a rich, uh, rich blessing to us. So we'll move on here in a minute, but before I do, any questions or reflections on anything we've mentioned so far? Okay. Well, again, like I said at the outset of class, uh, this class is intended to be kind of a complement to a couple of our Old Testament classes. We've been, over the past year, we've been pretty Old Testament focused uh, on Wednesday nights, um, and so... Uh, this is meant to kind of be a compliment or a payoff for that. And so how does Hebrews do that? How does Hebrews uh, help us appreciate the Old Testament and what it means for us? Well, first of all, Hebrews uses the Old Testament a lot. Uh, it actually, it probably uses the Old Testament more than any other New Testament book. And when I say that, and when we think about the New Testament using the Old Testament the first thing that might come to our minds is uh, when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, and a lot of your Bibles may put Old Testament quotes in italics or, or center them in the page to help you see where a quotation is going on. Um, and, and there are a good number of quotations of the Old Testament in Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews actually has the longest Old Testament quotation in the whole New Testament. It's there in the book of Hebrews, so it quotes it a lot. But actually, quotations of the Old Testament just scratch the surface of the way Hebrews uses uh, the Old Testament. Hebrews, beyond directly quoting Old Testament passages, it really just saturates itself in 
uh, the language of the Old Testament, in the themes of the Old Testament, in the story of the Old Testament that we spent all last fall looking at. Um, and so this is part of why Hebrews can be so challenging. Um, if we're not as familiar with the Old Testament, then that makes Hebrews quite a bit harder. But Hebrews really um, is saturated in the language of the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah, and, and we'll see that even beginning next week with uh, Hebrews 1. So yeah, really saturates itself in the, in the Old Testament. And as it, do, as it does that, Hebrews shows us something that's really valuable. He, Hebrews shows us how following Jesus means a new way of reading the Bible. Uh, we read the Bible differently than uh, the Israelites would have before Jesus came along. And of course we read the Bible differently than uh, non-believers of, of various sorts today. But Hebrews really shows us a Christian way to read the Israelite Old Testament. The Old Testament was the scriptures, it was the scriptures for the Jews long before Jesus came around. Uh, but Hebrews shows us a Christian way to look at those same scriptures. And we'll see as we go along how Hebrews, and not just Hebrews, but actually the rest of the New Testament as well, but in doing this, Hebrews does not always actually read the Old Testament exactly the same way that we tend to read it, even. It, it makes some, some decisions about what's going on in the Old Testament that we would probably not normally make on our own living here in 2023. Uh, and we'll see what I mean by that as we move on in, in, into, the, into the book in future weeks. But a huge, a major feature of a Christian reading of the Old Testament uh, is, is this. All of it um, is read in light of the coming of Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament is read kind of through the lens of Jesus' coming and his death, his resurrection, uh, his second coming. Uh, and so the idea is that the coming of Jesus throws new light on the Old Testament that people could not see before, before Jesus came. Um, and, and Paul even talks some about, uh, in, this is in 2 Corinthians, the idea that there's a veil over the Jewish people when they read the scriptures and they can't see everything that's going on, but in Christ the veil is lifted. Well, Hebrews is like a textbook example of how that works. Uh, it's throwing new light on the Old Testament. And so this is a great way that Hebrews shows us the ongoing value of the Old Testament. Um, a lot of Christians, and this is just really common, uh, a lot of Christians just prefer not to really think about the Old Testament very much uh, and, and prefer to read the New Testament much more than read uh, the Old Testament. And there's a, a lot of reasons for that. But if we just want to focus on the New Testament and ignore the Old Testament and we want to take the New Testament seriously, we actually can't even do that for very long before we're like convicted to read the Old Testament because the New Testament takes the Old Testament really seriously. The New Testament um, basically says, you gotta have what the Old Testament said to really understand what I'm saying. Uh, and so Hebrews is a great um, example of this. Uh, I don't have this scripture on the screen, but um, if you've got your Bibles, you may wanna turn to Romans chapter 15 and verse four that illustrates this really well. Romans 15, uh, verse 4, Paul says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through the endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. I heard some pages turning while I was reading, so I'm going to read it again. It says, For whatever was written in former days, that would be the Old Testament, was written for our instruction. Right? Talking to Christians that through the endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And so again, that passage is not from Hebrews, that's from Romans, but it's making a statement there that the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, would definitely agree with. Uh, Hebrews is like an illustration of the truth of Romans 15, verse 4. <clears throat> so um, Hebrews demonstrates for us how Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament story and how he is at the, the center. He's, he's like the focal point of that, that grand story of redemption that runs throughout, especially the Old Testament, but really runs throughout the whole Bible. Uh, Christ is at the center of it. Any thoughts, questions on um, 
on Hebrews and the Old Testament before we move forward. Okay, well, we'll get into some introductory matters for reading Hebrews, uh, and then we'll really get into the book starting next week. But um, we'll think about a few introductory things here in the time we have left. So starting with, I've got it on the screen already, but one of the most basic things to appreciate about any book of the Bible uh, before we start reading it is to think about who wrote it. And Bob mentioned this just a moment ago. So who wrote Hebrews? What did you say? Yeah, okay, so Mary thinks it's by Paul. Anybody else want to venture on who wrote Hebrews? <laughs> Chris, you want to want to venture a, a thought there? I've got my opinion, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> I, I would be very curious to hear it, if you'd like to share it. <laughs> sure. You know, I like Apollos as the author of Hebrews. Yeah, yeah, and who is Apollos? Yep. So, and there's other reasons why I don't think Paul wrote it, but uh, I was kind of surprised that Martin Luther thought that Paul wrote it. I didn't know that. Yeah, and uh, among some others, but it, it actually surprised me. Yeah, I didn't know that. Martin Luther thought Apollos wrote Hebrew. So, yeah, Apollos is mentioned in Acts. He's this really persuasive, uh, gifted speaker, but he doesn't know the full gospel. And so, Aquila and Priscilla, this missionary uh, couple, they pull Apollos aside, teach him some more about the gospel. And then we know he goes on to continue serving the church. Uh, and so, yeah, folks have put him forward as a candidate for the book of Hebrews. Any other opinions? It doesn't say, so we really don't know. Does it? Yeah, that's right. It doesn't say? We can guess. Yeah, the truth is, one knows. Uh, so, yeah, Paul has been mentioned, Apollos. Uh, some people have suggested, actually, oh, go ahead, Dave. My Bible says Silas or Barnabas. That's yeah, yeah. Um, Silas has been mentioned. I actually hadn't heard Barnabas before, but I think he would be just as good a candidate as Silas. Uh, Luke, actually, who we're studying on Sunday mornings, and we have been for, for a while now. Uh, Luke has been put forward as a candidate for the book of Hebrews. Um, Ernie said it best. We said, we just don't know. Um, someone else who said that really well, a gentleman by the name of Origen, it's an interesting name, isn't it? The name is Origen. Um, but he lived in the late 100s AD, uh, I think maybe into the early 200s. He was a great, like, really world, res well, world respected within, the, within Christianity, uh, Christian teacher. And when he writes about Hebrews, he says, only God knows who wrote Hebrews. And that sums it up really well. No one actually knows who wrote this book. Um, so, moving on from authorship, probably the second most basic thing to appreciate about a book of the Bible uh, before reading it is also to know who it's written to. This is something else we typically like to know before we start reading a uh, book of the Bible. So, who is Hebrews written to? There was no original title, correct? That's right. Yep. So I can imagine those type of individuals, the Hebrew that it's written to, and, and knowing the new context and content of Hebrews. Yeah. Those are the individuals that are written to. It's just uh, yeah. those that are not Hellenistic Jews. Yeah. But it's for everybody. Yeah. And, and the thing is about, uh, go ahead, Mary. Well, I was just thinking it was for the Jews, wasn't it? Well, the Christians even, Jews, right? Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, though, when we say like it's written to, to Christian Jews, Jewish Christians, that's really broad, right? It doesn't actually even tell you anything. I mean, there's, there's a lot of those people scattered everywhere. Uh, and so once again, we're actually left with the same answer as who wrote Hebrews. No one actually knows who Hebrews is written to in terms of like a specific audience. Like if you turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, well, it's written to the church in Corinth. 
right? You turn to Philippians, it's written to the church of Philippi. Uh, you turn to Revelation, it's written to seven different churches in Asia Minor. No one knows who, who Hebrews is actually, in terms of a specific audience. Um, Yeah, I mean, in some sense, it doesn't matter in the sense that it's still a revelation to us, right? It's God's word to us. In some sense, it does help to know who a book is written to. Uh, I think about letters like First and Second Timothy. It's really helpful to know Timothy's a young man who's a minister who's followed Paul. Now he's in Ephesus where Paul had his most successful mission work, and he's trying to carry on Paul's work. Like, that stuff can help us understand why First Timothy says what it says. Um, but Hebrews, we just don't have that type of advantage. Uh, now, some people have thought that Rome is maybe the best option for where Hebrews is written to because of some of some references to, to those who were from Italy at the end of Hebrews. Um, but and, and like Ernie was kind of touching on earlier, and like you just said, Chris, it's often assumed to be written to Jews because it uses the Old Testament so much. But even still, others who have read this book very carefully and closely have actually suggested, actually, maybe it's written to Gentiles. Um, and, and then, of course, there's also the reality that most Christian churches uh, consisted not of just Jews or Gentiles, but a mix. And so we've got to think about that, too. Um, go ahead, Ernie. Would it be wrong to assume uh, that it was written to the Hebrew Christians? Well, that's what Chris was saying a moment ago. Oh, I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I don't think it would be, it'd be wrong to assume that. No, I don't think it'd be wrong to assume that. But again, it, it, does, it doesn't tell us a ton because that is such a broad, uh, a broad audience. Uh, so we can't get much more specific than that. Um, two things that we can know about the audience of Hebrews that actually Ernie touched on a little while ago. Uh, we know from the text of Hebrews, from some, some things it says near the end of the book, we know that first of all, these people have been Christians for a while. They're not brand new converts. And secondly, we know that they faced some persecution in the past. Uh, not persecution in the sense that they've been like thrown in, into the arena to be fed to lions, but they've, they've faced some suffering for being Christians. Uh, and we also know that they're facing some new challenges. They faced challenges in the past, and it's like, here comes another wave of challenges, and it's wearing them out. And they're considering just giving up on following Christ. And they're considering as an alternative, it seems, and we'll see this as we go along, they're considering just relying on the law of Moses instead, which makes us think, okay, maybe it's Jews, but there are actually some Gentiles who really were interested in Judaism as well. Uh, so they could be tempted with this same thing. But uh, again, we'll see evidence for those kind of basic facts as we go along in Hebrews. Um, there's a, enough references to those things for us to be confident about them. But again, in terms of like, who was the specific audience and where do they live? We don't know. Uh, the third most basic thing to ask about a book is to ask when it was written. And yeah, go ahead. We don't know. We don't know. That's right. Uh, no one knows when this book was written. Uh, there, there's not enough clues in the book to give us a, a real definite date. Uh, with, again, thinking about the letters of Paul, uh, there are certain moments in his life that we can date very precisely, and from those we can date the rest of his letters with, with a pretty good degree of confidence. Just can't do that with Hebrews. Uh, so I say all that to say there's a lot of mystery surrounding uh, the book of Hebrews. It, it's, it's like this anomaly sitting in the New Testament that's big and kind of, comp and kind, kind of difficult to read, and there's so much we don't know about it. And, and that's part of what I think makes it such a fascinating book uh, to me. Uh, but again, it's, it's also part of what can make reading this book kind of difficult. We typically like to know the answers to these things uh, before we jump into to reading the Bible. But with all these things that we don't really know about Hebrews, um, the most important thing to know about it, to help us read it, is actually given to us in the text of Hebrews. Uh, and that's from Hebrews 13 and verse 22. Uh, can I get a volunteer to read for us, Hebrews 13, 22? Barbara's not here, so somebody's going to have to step up. Barbara, need to be reached. <laughs> O'Brien, I saw your hand up. I appeal to you, brother. Oh, hang on. <laughs> there we go. 
I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. All right. This is one thing we can know about Hebrews that will be very helpful, I think, for us reading it. Hebrews calls itself a word of exhortation. That's how it, it refers to itself. Now, we tend to think of Hebrews as a letter, like we would Paul's letters. We might call it the letter to the Hebrews. Um, but actually, the book at no point refers to itself that way. It calls itself a word of exhortation. It's a little bit enigmatic. Anyone want to maybe uh, throw out for some ideas about what is a word of exhortation? What do you typically think of when you think of a word of exhortation? Persevere. What did you say? Persevere. Okay, a word, yeah, to persevere, yeah. If someone is going to offer you a word of exhortation, though, what are they doing? Encouraging. They're encouraging you, right? Encouraging. It's inspired by God. What would you say, Ms. Joe? An invitation. An invitation. Okay, so that, that starts to get into a little of, of uh, what, what I think could be going on here. Each Sunday, we extend the invitation, right? It's a chance for anyone to come forward who needs prayer or is not a Christian, and that happens at the end of the sermon. Well, yeah, go ahead, Mary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that Hebrews is a call to persevere. But in terms of what kind of book it is, it, it doesn't call itself a letter. Again, it never refers to itself that way. It calls itself a word of exhortation. So where I'm going with this, I'd be curious to, to hear what you think, if, you, if you'd like to share. But a great example of a word of exhortation is a sermon. That's what a sermon tries to do. Uh, a sermon is meant to exhort people, and it's a word, right? It's the spoken word, a series of words meant to exhort you uh, to live faithfully. Now, if Hebrews were a letter, we would probably expect it to begin the way Paul's letters begin, and the way actually pretty much every letter from 2,000 years ago tended to begin. I think we all know how Paul's letters begin because we've probably read them a good number of times. Paul's letters begin by first naming the author. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ, you know, and then he names the people he's writing to. He says, to the church that is at Corinth or whatever. And then he tends to greet them. He often says, grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. That's standard way to begin letters from 2,000 years ago. Now, today, if we were to write a letter, we'd say, dear whoever. But 2,000 years ago, you would name yourself, say who you're writing to, and give a greeting. Well, Hebrews doesn't do that doesn't do that at all. Um, but if Hebrews is something more like a sermon, then it makes sense that Hebrews, in, instead of beginning that way, would just launch right into its content. Because if you're preaching to a group of people, you don't have to get up and name yourself. You don't have to say who you're speaking to. Everybody already knows that. You're right there with them. So you can just get up and launch right into uh, your material. And that's exactly what Hebrews does. Uh, now, Hebrews does have some things at the very end, in chapter 13, that read a little bit like the close of a letter. The end of Hebrews 13 sounds kind of like the end of some of Paul's letters. Um, so, it, what it could be happening is Hebrews was a sermon that someone originally preached to a congregation. And then that sermon was written down and sent to another congregation so that they could be encouraged by it. And some closing comments were added at the end of the sermon. And again, all this would be happening by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is all scripture at the end of the day. Um, but anyways, I want to propose to you that while with Paul we have letters, with the Gospels we have accounts of Jesus' life, with Hebrews it seems to be that we have a sermon that at one point was preached to a first century church and then was written down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, you might think, all right, why does all this matter? I mean, if it's a letter, if it's a sermon, what's the difference? But identifying Hebrews as a word of exhortation or identifying it as a sermon is actually really important, important for helping us appreciate the most unique thing about the book of Hebrews. 
Hebrews is really unique in the New Testament because it is the longest sustained presentation of a single argument, a single line of thought uh, in the New Testament. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you compare Hebrews to, again, think about like the letters of Paul. Paul tends to move from one topic to another topic to another. Great place to see this especially is in a book like 1 Corinthians. He says, all right, I'm going to talk about this. You guys are doing this wrong. Shape up. You guys are doing this wrong. Shape up. I love you, by the way. You guys are doing this wrong. You know, that's the way 1 Corinthians goes. Uh, and his other letters work very much the same way. Sometimes he has one or two things to talk about, but he, he shifts from one thing to the next. Well, the Gospels, think about the Gospels. You read one teaching of Jesus, and then another teaching of Jesus, and then maybe there'll be like a miracle that occurs, and then another. So you're moving from topic to topic. Not so with Hebrews. Hebrews begins with a single idea that starts with Hebrews 1 and verse 1. And the whole book is concerned with that idea. It is one argument, one train of thought from beginning to uh, to end. And so uh, seeing Hebrews as a, as a sermon, I think, uh, can help us understand why it works that way and can help us read it better. Uh, Hebrews is hard to read like a chapter a night before bed because it's one line of thought. And so if 24 hours pass and you read Hebrews chapter 6 and then next night I'm going to read Hebrews 7, well, you're reading one train of thought and 24 hours have passed. It's kind of hard to pick back up, right? Uh, but if Hebrews is a sermon, it makes sense that it's, it's working that way. Um, I'll, I'll confess, when I preach, uh, I try to have one line of thought. Now, sometimes I do that with two or three points, but there's always one unifying idea that I'm trying to get across by the end of the sermon. And whether or not I do that well is, is up to you guys to judge. But I, I try to do that, and Hebrews does that very same thing. All right, so... Um, that pretty much wraps up the introduction I wanted us to think about for Hebrews. Um, next week, we will begin looking at that big idea, that sustained line of thought from beginning to end that is in the book of Hebrews. And again, to give us a little preview of basically what it is, Hebrews wants us to know Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that the Old Testament uh, looks forward to, and Jesus is on our side. He cares about you. He loves you. He's in heaven working for you right now. And that is meant to give us the strength to persevere, to hang on, uh, and to live faithfully our entire lives uh, and to have a close, fulfilling relationship as we do that while looking forward to the, the reward, the hope that is laid up for us uh, in heaven. That's what Hebrews is really trying to do. Any uh, parting questions or reflections or thoughts on anything we've talked about tonight? before we uh, dismiss. Bob. Here, Lee, if you don't mind, I hope I could have created a slide. Do you have Hebrews 13, verse 22? Yep. It says, I personally, I have, in the second page of that verse, I have written to you briefly. Now, that's in the past tense, right? Yep. So I'm thinking, <laughs> and I'm thinking that maybe we look at Romans the Old Testament is for our what? It's for our learning. And I'm yep. thinking he's going back to that. That's what I'm thinking. I may be off key here, but that says, for I have written unto you, but the Old Testament is for our learning. That's maybe what he's talking about. I don't know. What do you think? Well, of course, it'll be a while until we come to Hebrews 13 in the class. Yeah, okay. But in the context, this is at the very end of the book. There's 13 chapters in Hebrews. And he closes out. He's near the end. He's pretty much wrapped up that 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 one long argument from the beginning. And he says, all right, now that we're wrapping up, uh, I appeal to you, bear with this word, exer word of exhortation. Okay, you're bear skipping, bear you're with what on. I've just said. You're skipping on us. <laughs> does that make sense, though? Yes, it does. It yeah, says. yeah. And the funny thing is, he says, I've written to you briefly, mm -hmm. and Hebrews is kind of a long book. Right. Um, yeah, so, so. Yeah, all the other verses. If you think my sermons are uh, short, <laughs> uh, Hebrews... He would just say mine are way too short. What did you say? How long would it take you to read Hebrews as a sermon? Yeah, I don't know. I, I've never tried. I could try it this Sunday. I don't think we fit it in before. Yeah. My Bible has a little reading time indicator. It says it would take 25 minutes. 
I don't know if you if you're trying to make extra points in there, it'd probably take a, closer to an hour. <laughs> yeah. If you ever want to try it, there, there you go. Yeah, and reading time is a lot different than speaking time as well. Absolutely. If you want to speak it well and not just not just say it blandly, yeah. All right. Well, uh, I know we talked about a lot of things, but let me just leave us with this this final word of exhortation. Uh, Hebrews is a beautiful book, powerful book, and the whole message is a call to persevere and hang on and to let us know why we can do that, because of what God has done, because of what Jesus has done, and it's all worth it. Uh, that's the message of Hebrews. And so we've talked about a lot, but if it's too much, just focus on that main thing, and we're going to get into that main thing starting uh, next week. So thank you all for your time. Thank you for uh, bearing with me, and next week we'll get into Hebrews. Thank you.